I swear to God, if I have to play one more sandbox MMO that screams do whatever you want just to cover up the fact it doesn't have a bloody storyline, I am going to stab someone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Drive Hayes. I've spent years playing the best MMO games available. Now it's time to do the opposite and find the worst of the worst. I'm going to play them all so you don't have to. Join me on a journey through the most awful MMOs I can find. Drop a like on the vid, sub to the channel and ring the bell so you don't miss a single video. If you're enjoying my videos and want to help me make more, you can support through the Patreon like all these awesome people have. You'll find the link in the description below. Today we're playing Ryzom. It's on Steam, it's free, and it's only 7 gigs, so let's give it a go. Now the history of Ryzom is fascinating. It was made by a French company, then changed hands multiple times, went through various monetization methods, had some expansions, and actually got remarkably good reviews for the time. From what I can find, it was a decent little MMO many years ago, but it's not many years ago, it's today. It's right now, and that's what we'll be reviewing off. So if you're a Ryzom fan expecting praise, let me save you some time, just go ahead and write a hateful comment right now. Because this game has not aged well. I will be fair to it, I will point out what it does well, but I'll also be objective. I have no nostalgia or pre-existing love for this game, so my experience is purely as a brand new player today. Let's start with something good. The music that plays over the Steam trailer is absolutely beautiful. It's hauntingly epic, just overwhelmingly gorgeous. The only problem with the game is everything else. First of all, it launches in a window, which is fine, I can resize that, but it's not optimised for dual monitors, and when I do resize it, the cursor disappears. I know the cursor is on the game because I can see it in my recording software, but it's hidden on the actual game window. What an odd bug. Anyway, some resizing and jiggling around, and it starts to run. Character creation, you've got four races, they're all similar shaped human models, but come from very different aesthetic backgrounds, which is nice. Now, I've played so many of these games recently, I'm starting to get into a habit of sliding any customization sliders to the extreme and seeing how dumb it looks. I'm happy to report this looks pretty dumb. Game then asks if I want to play with arrow keys as movement or WASD. What a stupid question. Who the hell uses arrow keys for movement? If you do, please leave a comment down below explaining your awful choice. The loading screen lets me know this is episode one, the one where Nexus is discovered. Seriously, it begins with the one where. You're following the same naming conventions as episodes of Friends. Okay. So we start the game with the traditional camera angle of on the ground, between my legs, staring up at my balls. You know, that famous starting shot that all successful MMOs do. WASD movement, except A and D turn the camera, they're not strafe, so I guess we're rebinding some keys. I press escape from the menu, but no escape does nothing, no menu for me. You've got to click the system button down in the bottom right. I rebind strafe and then, ah, I see why strafe wasn't bound as standard. It's so incredibly slow. Also, the screen seems to have resized itself between loading and playing, so now there's a black bar at the bottom. Let me fix that. Talking to NPCs, you've got to right-click them, it'll bring up a menu that's anchored to the NPC model. No text box or chat box, anything they do say appears over their head. This does mean if they walk off in the middle of talking, you've got to chase them down, or you'll click on the wrong thing, which happens a lot. Oh, quick camera bug, I've rebound A and D to strafe, but holding right-click spins the camera, and while holding right-click, A and D no longer strafe, they now also spin the camera. I talk to the camp guide. She lets me choose which of the four main areas I want to learn first. Combat, magic, gathering, or crafting. So let's go with combat. The background chirping noise is incessant and extremely annoying, but thankfully it's drowned out by the even louder, even more annoying combat sounds of these two guys fighting. The combat trainer explains combat badly. It's like the whole game wants to be tough to understand and hard to learn, and oh don't worry, I will cover that in depth later. Eventually, he explains, we can see what's equipped to our hands at the top of the screen, left hand and right hand. We need to equip a weapon in our right hand to fight. That makes sense. During combat, you'll see this bar. This shows you what action is being performed now and what action you have queued up next. You can change the queued up action at any time before it actually starts. Killing an enemy lets you skin them, or as the game puts it, quarter them. I kill three basic things and return to the trainer. The irritating thing about the conversation window is you need to click this little arrow to move through them. But the arrow is anchored to the window, and the window changes size depending on how much text is in it. 
So if you miss and click X, you'll just close the whole dialogue. Finish this and the quest list is empty. So, um, what do I do now? Where do I go? All right, listen, I can hear all you Ryzen fans shouting, this game doesn't hold your hand. Okay, look, I can understand that, but let me explain why that's not always a good thing and how the general attitude of hardcore is better doesn't always work. I swear this needs to be its own video, but I'm getting fed up of explaining it. Everyone learns new things in different ways. Some people like reading comprehensive instructions before starting, some like watching others, and some like just jumping in and giving it a go. Whatever works for you, no method is strictly better or worse as long as the outcome for each individual person is the same. I've been a teacher of various things my entire life, from martial arts to MMO guides to acting. My job has involved showing people how to do stuff, and no matter how that individual student learns, there is a constant that's expected of the teacher and that is a willingness to teach and reward curiosity and effort. If you want to learn, I want to teach you. Some video games take this to heart too much and force a tutorial on the player, which is irritating. It doesn't work for the player who learns through doing. You are removing their choice. You're alienating a large chunk of your audience. But then you've got hardcore games that do the opposite. They believe everyone should learn by doing and so remove any tutorial, instruction of defined path to progress along. The fans of the game will scream about how this makes it hardcore and realistic, but in reality, no, all it does is instantly put off a large chunk of the population who learn by reading and following a set curriculum. The best thing for a game to do is have access to all of these methods of learning and let the player choose the one they want to follow. The worst thing Ryzen does is pride itself on just how damn difficult it is to get into. You have super complex deep systems, which do indeed provide the player with a massive amount of variety, and we will come to the good part of these later, but they're not explained well. They're not intuitive to use and they're not essential for early game progress, which means the majority of new players will either miss or not understand them, meaning new player retention is going to be at an all-time low. Now maybe you're a hardcore player who's discovered everything and feels hugely accomplished and if so, well done. You're clearly someone who wants to put hours into this game and learn it. But every bit of feedback I've had from games like this it's always the same. It gets good if you play it more. You need to put effort into it. It rewards your time, and I understand that. But why would I put my time into a learning process I either don't enjoy, don't learn from, or don't understand? The phrase, this game doesn't hold your hand, is meant to mean the game will put you in a challenging position and test your skill but is also willing to provide you with the guidance and support you ask for if you ever do ask for it. But that's not the case here. This is more a we won't explain anything and expect everyone to work it out and provide their own adventure, which for many players will not be an enjoyable experience. It in itself is not a bad experience, but it is not a universally enjoyed one. Just imagine taking this attitude to anything else. Imagine trying to learn a new language and the teacher just shouts, this class won't hold your hand and throws test after test at you in a language you don't read. Or a boxing class screaming, no hand holding, and makes you fight the biggest, fastest guy there on your first day. You'd be rightly pissed off that the thing isn't teaching the way you learn. It's just being obtusely difficult for the sake of being obtusely difficult because they think this makes it challenging, when in reality, it makes it difficult to start. It's not fun for the majority of players, and this is why your game is dying. These games don't fail because they're complex and deep, because believe it or not, people do actually like complex and deep games. They fail because they don't give new players the correct introduction and education about how complex and deep they are, and how to succeed within such a complex and deep world. While you may feel proud that you got dropped into the middle of a deserted land and managed to forage a living and are now quite powerful, you'll find very few other players willing to do this when the initial experience of other games is so much better. I don't care if you become the best MMO experience after 500 hours because those initial 500 will be so bloody irritating and frustrating that I won't make it through them. I'll be spending those 500 hours playing a game that seems excited to have me as a player and actually want me to understand it, and we'll come back to this point later. I opened this mission booklet. It's no real help. There's no daily missions, and I feel directionless. I asked for info on this NPC, and wow, the game displays this border. But the border graphical text location on the server is overlaid. 
That's a pretty big oversight that makes your game look very amateur. Click around on the UI for a bit, the Identity tab doesn't say anything, you'd likely have to write your own in, which is a nice touch, but the Inventory tab is formatted so bloody awfully, vertical scroll lists don't work for inventories because they don't let you see what you're carrying at a glance, which is one of the main functions of an inventory. And if you think I'm nitpicking, please remember the game released in 2004, they've had almost 17 years to make this better. I go back to the guide, ask about harvesting, and they send me south. Now, I'd love to head south, but the compass on your screen has no direction markings and spins with you, so you can't orientate yourself with it. You have to open the world map. And do you want to see the default setting for the world map? Here it is. What the actual shit is that? How is that meant to help anyone? Yes, you can resize and rescale the map, but why does it open in this size? Once you've made it bigger, the world map itself is serviceable. Gathering is complex because everything in this game needs to be overly complex and contains several variables because that's what makes it hardcore. Even remembering how all these numbers relate to each other is in itself a task. To gather, you have to unequip your weapon from your right hand and equip your gathering tool. It's not enough to just have the tool in the inventory. It must be equipped. Why? because adding in another pointless transition system makes it even more hardcore, that's why. So even the gathering materials have five variables, source extraction time, which is how long you've got left to collect it, contents of how much is left in it, the life of the source which goes down as you mine it, the risk of the source blowing up, and the cami tolerance, which is how pissed off the local cami are that you're gathering stuff, and if you ever max this out, you'll die. This is so overly complex, it almost seems like a parody of gathering in MMOs, like they're purposely sat down to make it satirical of how complex a simple task is becoming. And it's not like these bars add anything fun to the game, because you'll only ever care about the bar that goes down the fastest, because that's the only one that will ever affect you. So it's essentially you watching one bar, which is likely just the time left to gather. Foraging can fail, too. The first time I failed to extract, the second I just can't click for some reason, and the third it said I'm too far away, which is just wrong. You also don't get one item per hit because that'd be too simple, you slowly build up how many you will find going up by 0.2 or 0.3 at a time, and what quality they'll be when you finish which also increases slowly. See overly complex for what it is without adding any more fun gameplay. I hand in what I've gathered and side hop over to the next dude. They teach me basic prospecting, which is a skill that makes resources appear wherever I am. Which I find is actually not true, because you can cast it and it fails. So you need to move and cast it again, and again and again, until a resource decides to show up. This is the type of game that takes a long time to get anywhere, and while I can understand that hard work does make for fulfilling achievements, having a system fail to do what it says it's going to do just to pad out your gameplay isn't good design. I level up my harvesting and finish the quest, then start the next. The second harvesting quest needs me to do what I had done to finish the first, so I've already done it. Also, the text box over the head is getting a little old now, it doesn't make the world more immersive, it makes the clickable zone more awkward. Game says go north, but still no north on the minimap. Thankfully it does give you a handy dandy arrow pointing to wherever your next objective is. Kinda dull not being able to jump, so I hop into the menu to find out what key jump is bound to, and it isn't. There is no jump in this game. And you know what, while I'm nitpicking, look at this. The bottom edging graphic of this menu window isn't even correct. It curves round to close it off, but then looks like another window should be starting underneath it. This is Graphic Design 101. Finish your UI. You've had 17 years. My god, there's another player. I shout, another player, but they don't respond. Also, your chat doesn't appear in a bubble over your head, which is both inconsistent with how NPCs have been shown to work and a personal shame, because I like it when chat does that. Why the actual hell is there an MP3 player in the main options panel? Like this option has a dedicated button on the main screen overlay. Who is loading MP3s into this? And do you really have such little faith in your own in-game music and sounds? You're giving the player the option to listen to something else. I prospect around this tower to find three seeds, the casting time is long and the sound effect oddly loud, and it's not always successful, making a short task take a surprising amount of time. 
I hand in the next harvest quest, I feel like I'm making at least some progress. And the next harvest quest again needs me to do what I did to end the previous quest. Like task 2 ends with do A and task 3 starts with check you've done A. Of course I have, that's how I finished the previous task. Did you test this? Now we're shown a very complex but rather interesting system, creating your own actions. See, all actions are made of stanzas. Think of them like little Lego bricks you build up to make one complete thing. For example, you could have the base action of look for items, then the additional stanza of fine quality only, then a look faster addition, meaning you quickly look for fine resources. The same is true for attacks and spells. You build a complete action out of the stanzas you've unlocked. I have to admit, the idea of creating your own custom actions and abilities is awesome. And it's truly a shame the interface you do this on and the explanation you are given in the game is so damn awful. It's not aged well. It's a grainy, mostly text-based vertical list. While this will definitely appeal to those insufferable gamers who like to shout about how hardcore they are, it will put off most people from even trying because of how dense it looks, despite actually being a very free-form and creative addition to the game. Each custom action starts with the root stanza, then you add extra touches, and finally you add the balance, which makes sure it's not overpowered. The balances can be the casting time of the ability, the resource cost, or the cooldown timer. It essentially keeps the skills in check. Now I need to find specific fine resources. There's a flag on the map showing where. It's quite the journey away, and the graphics were good for the time, but nothing to write home about today. I swear I've seen this same tree in like five different MMOs but I've never seen it have such a massive hitbox before. Why does the tree graphics start so far inside the physical asset box? It turns to night and we can press L to light up. Not sure how, we don't have a torch or a flashlight, we just glow. I find it odd the same game that made resource gathering contain five different subsystems seems happy to just assume we've got a light bulb shoved up our ass. Use the special prospecting skill to find stuff. Sometimes the gathering animation will just stop, but you'll still gather stuff. I need to find two types of resources, but I can't control which one spawns, so it's just a lot of trial and error. I report back and hand in, and while this is nice, I want to do more than just gather things. So I go back to the guide, ask about magic, and she points me to the local sage. Magical energy in the world of Rhizom is known as sap. Every living thing has some level of sap inside them, and casting magic uses sap, which then refills mana. Just call it mana. We all know it as mana, it will continue to be known as mana. You're not special for using a different word for a system that is already well established. We can cast a basic acid spell, so off we trot to kill three things. It's raining in-game, and the rain sounds, combined with the rather good rain ambience filter, actually build up a really nice feeling. It's very, very ambient. The graphics and sound combine well to become greater than the sum of their parts. Unfortunately, that in general is let down by the overall aesthetic. There's no rubbish around the city, no lived-in bulk, no people sitting down or objects laying around in a realistic living village style way. It's very clean-cut buildings and identical-looking NPCs. It looks like a video game. The magic casting animation, however, is really nice and smooth, with well-made lighting effects casting an eerie green glow as the orb of green acid is twirled round our body and thrown toward the enemy. Good job there. Another minor gripe, the right-click menu on every NPC always lags a split second behind. You'll click an NPC, get the menu pop-up, showing some generic options. Then it'll quickly refresh and show the actual options, like the game is catching up with what you're actually doing. We're taught about magic amplifiers. The game makes them sound rather complex until you realise it just means equip a magic item in your right hand. Do you know what my favourite aspect of a medieval fantasy village is? It's the massive sci-fi industrial complex surrounded by electricity. That's always been my favourite medieval structure. The magic task needs me to kill four jars. I must use the amplifier to kill all four in 60 seconds. Pretty simple. Return to the task givers and the menu continues to lag. Now I've noticed it, I can't unnotice it. And you'll see it as well if you try and play this game. We are now asked to help a crying child, because this man heard him crying in the distance. Dude, how did you hear the child crying? He is miles away on the edge of a cliff, surrounded by howling wind. 
This view, however, is impressive. The endless fields down below fading away into the distance, the giant tree roots snaking through the sky overhead, and the fog hiding whatever is making those deep bellowing noises in the distance. It's fair to say this is a terrifying situation. The sheer scale of the endless nothing ahead of me is very, very frightening. The ambience is spoiled, however, by the fact this kid makes crying noises, but they haven't got a child actor to cry. It's clearly a fully grown man sobbing badly. The kid asks for my clothes. Oh, wow, okay, I'm on a cliff edge far away from any witnesses and a child is asking me for my clothes. I think I need an adult. I refuse to give the kid my clothes because I'd like to avoid prison and he says fine. My men will take them anyway. Shock, shock, horror. Turns out he is a bandit and I'm about to be mugged. Oh no, here comes the action section. Several bandits spawn on the only path back, all members of the Goo Heads bandit gang. So I'm trapped, but they don't do anything. And they'll happily stand there as I casually melt them with acid one at a time from a distance. Not the sharpest tools in the shed. I kill all four and return to the sage, let him know the crying kid was a bandit, and we should probably lock him up, but he doesn't seem fussed either way and instead focuses on the fact I destroyed the pots really well. Continuing with magic, I'm shown how to make the Cold One spell, which is an action made up of five individual stanzas, the missile spell type, the Cold Element effect, a range credit, three sap credits, and one casting time credit. It's nice to see how they all fit together, but I feel a deeper explanation of this system would go a long way toward making players appreciate how good it actually is. The next magic task says, go and train magic to level 10. No need, my friend, I'm already level 10, so let's just carry on straight away. As you level up either combat, magic, harvesting, or crafting, you'll gain skill points in that skill. You then spend these skill points at a skill trainer to learn new stuff. So I spend my magic points and buy a higher level acid spell. Now this next task is where the game falls down. I need to travel to the hunting grounds, handily shown on the map, and hunt 10 weaned rendors, but it suggests I take a team. This is the first group quest. It's possible, but difficult, to solo, and a low-level mage definitely won't manage it, so you need other people. It's a hell of a long journey, but on my way I pass this migrating train of animals, which actually looks Awesome, it's a really nice touch. More games should have herd migration. I try to solo kill an enemy and die. Death puts you into a coma and you either must wait to be revived or respawn at an unlocked respawn point. Doing this gives you a death penalty, which must be paid off in experience before you can continue progressing, because that's always a fun mechanic. Look game, the punishment for death is sending me back to the respawn point. Adding an experience penalty is just very demotivating. Hardcore fans will argue it adds to the immersion and makes you cautious. I'll argue it makes players never take any risks and pushes toward a much more slow and careful gameplay style, which while appealing to a certain group of players is not universally appealing to everyone. You cannot make choices for how the game should be played. I need a group for this quest, so I wonder how many people are playing. How many people like me are playing on Steam right now? Three. There are three active players according to the Steam charts. Now remember, this doesn't include people logged in through the game launcher, which I'm sure is more, but on Steam? Three? That's pathetic. Magic, combat, and gathering down. I go back to the guide and ask about crafting. I get sent to the crafting people and given some basic crafting materials. Remember, before you can craft, you need to equip the crafting tool. And it's a different tool for crafting armor or crafting weapons, just to be awkward. Crafting an item is, as all systems are so far, overly complex and under-explained. It's not a bad system, there's just a lot of moving parts to it the game seems determined to not fully explain. And it pushes you through at such breakneck speeds you'll be left saying, slow down game, I want to understand what I'm doing before I do it. Each crafted item has a base material, several secondary materials, and a few tertiary materials, and the quality of each of these affects the final product, so the crafting system itself can create massive variations within one specific item. Annoyingly, you can't even watch the crafting animation because the crafting window covers your character model up. I make some boots using what I've been given, then give them back. I'm told I would have gained 3,000 crafting experience, but instead I just paid off some of my death debt. 
Now the crafting guide gives me money and tells me to go to the store, then buy the correct ingredients to make some better boots. The shop interface is super text heavy. While it is technically serviceable and contains what I need to know, it's presented in such an ugly way I have to read every item to check its quality and quantity. I feel a tidy up here and a streamline would help a lot. I buy what I need, make the new boots and equip the new boots, but the quest maker needs me to hand them over, so off they come again. So there's even more complexity to crafting due to the variation within gathering ingredients. You see, each resource is rated on a scale of 1 to 5, from poor to excellent. Then within each specific rating, there's a numbered sub-rating from 1 to 250 essentially making 1,250 different qualities of any individual resource. Then using any of these to make an item will change the outcome, meaning there's essentially tens of thousands of different versions of a basic boot, all very slightly different. This will appeal to freeform players, but drive the completionists absolutely insane. So I've done every main aspect so far, combat, magic, gathering and crafting. There's no main storyline or plot, so all that remains is to make my own fun. I'm familiar with the sandbox mechanic. It's normally used to cover up the fact they've not bothered to write a storyline or include the player in an interesting event, instead opting to push us into the world and say, enjoy, explore, go and make your own fun. Game, look, if I was going to make my own fun in a world of endless possibilities, I'd actually go outside. I'm playing you to experience you, your story, your world. If your experience is limited to do whatever you want with no central story, then I'm going to leave and play a game that has one. There is a support team member, a game GM logged in, telling anyone to PM him if they have any questions. I can't fault this. It's brilliant to actually see an in-person GM interacting with the community and offering live help. Good on you, Jaden, wherever you are. I explore around the camp and discover the arena. It's a PvP zone with no rules. Anything goes. Enter at your own peril. Oh, hell yeah, some PvP action. Here we go. Bring it on, other players. The player versus player is somewhat hobbled due to the fact it needs other players to be fun. Also, the dance emote cuts off after a few seconds. That's awful. If a player types slash dance, make them dance until they decide to do something else. You've said I can do whatever I want. What I want to do is dance. Why are you stopping me? Maybe I'll just explore the map. The game has given me no real directions. Well, I'll give myself one. Up. I stick a map marker down and run toward it. While we're running, let's discuss an important concept in game design. Making the player want to be here. Games need time to play, and so a game needs to show the player that their time isn't being wasted. A game needs to seem excited that someone is playing it. By this I mean the opening of the game, the mid game and the end game all need to act as if having the player's attention is a privilege and reward us as the players for being here. Now that doesn't mean that we need colourful achievements and fireworks and pop-ups or participation trophies, I'm talking about systems and mechanics within the game, be they tutorials or goals that let the player know they are working towards something and their presence here is meaningful. The developers have created something for you, and you are able to experience it. Ryzon, along with many other hardcore MMOs, falls into the trap of making all the systems so complex and the tutorials so obtuse that it doesn't seem to care that it's being played. Consider it like this. Imagine you walk into a room and there's several people you don't know. A few are sitting in a corner brooding and not paying attention, while another person walks up to you and greets you politely, offers to explain what's going on and seems generally nice and genuine. It's highly likely you're going to spend more time with that person because they seem excited and happy to spend time with you. That person is a game that's happy to have you and wants to make your experience as fun as possible. Possible. It's a game that puts effort into making you, the player, feel welcome and important. Like Portal, or Bioshock, or Burnout, Guild Wars 2, Elder Scrolls Online, Final Fantasy XIV, hell, even Dark Souls made sure you knew what you were doing before throwing you into something tough. The guys sat in the corner might be deep, interesting, complex people, but most will never experience that because they are putting no effort into making sure new players are having a decent time with them. That'd be your Dwarf Fortress, Eve, EverQuest, and Morrowind. 
Despite being amazing games, they make getting to know how amazing they are so insanely difficult. I'm not saying dumb your systems down and be easy, I'm saying be excited to explain those systems in an easy way and help the players grasp the complexities. Because if you did this, you might still have players. Ultimately, I will put as much effort into playing the game as the game puts into making me want to play it. Equal and fair. I arrive at some ruins, aggro the bandits and get chased. I gather a small mob to test the pursuit range. It is remarkably long. Run past some kind of throne in the middle of nowhere, get attacked by a dog and die, building up even more debt. When you die, you respawn at the Kami. This Kami has a quest for me called Purge the Land, which sounds rather ominous and I can't accept it yet. I ask random NPCs about stuff, thinking maybe this is how I make a start on the episode 1 mission of Gather 65 Bits of Intel. And it turns out, yes, it is. Oh, the hyperlinks for conversation choices being linked to the speech bubble is getting super irritating as I need to talk to more people, because NPCs keep walking off while I'm trying to talk to them and I can't click the link. Players keep telling me how deep and involved this storyline is, and I'm sure it is ultimately, but most of the early game info I'm getting off these NPCs is utterly irrelevant. One keeps talking about how in love with someone he is, and someone else just says don't trust so-and-so, despite me not knowing who so-and-so is. And even though your reply is written as though the conversation should continue, it always ends after one text box. These aren't conversations, they're tiny, individual snippets of unimportant disconnected information. The episode 1 mission log asks me to collect 65 pieces of info on recent events and 50 on the chitin. So I ask everyone about everything. This is all I do for about 45 minutes. I just go around and ask everyone I can find about recent events and chitin. The repeated info starts about three people in, meaning you can't just expect one piece of info from every one person. And you can't ask one person 65 times because you get different info from different people. And there's no list of who you've asked what. So I just walk around talking to everyone. While I'm doing this, let's read some reviews. Remember, these reviews are as it is now, not as it was. Rhizom is a hardcore MMO by a developer that doesn't take the game seriously for people who have already been playing it for years. Stay away from this game unless you want to grind away hours of your life with nothing to show for it whatsoever. Save yourself the trouble and do not bother trying this game out. Now that Steam review actually goes on for about two full A4 pages of critique and is very in-depth. He makes some extremely accurate points, including... The game does not hold your hand at all. When you start playing, the game treats you like you should already know how everything works. There are mechanics to the game that are completely unexplained by the game itself. Rhizom is a game that has completely stagnated. The game is in maintenance mode and the developers are catering to their existing player base that has been subscribed to the game for years by doing absolutely nothing because none of these players want anything about the game to ever change. You've then got other reviews such as Rhizom is a wonderful game that has many things to do in the game with wonderful mechanics and the best foraging and crafting system I have ever seen in a game. However, the community is dead and the developers are not moving forward with projects or ideas that will bring people into the game anytime soon. They would rather try to keep their smaller community base than expanding into a larger community base by adding in a few rules and making more of the game accessible to free players. Because of this, I would consider a new player to the game to be wasting their time, since the game will not be moving in a forward direction anytime soon, it seems. I wonder if this game has Steam achievements. It does. Three. They are all hidden, but using Google I could find them. How many Steam players do you think have any of these three achievements? 0% on all three. So I've asked everyone I can find about the camp and the rumours and the chitin. I've found 22 out of 65 rumours and 10 out of 50 chitin things. There is no main plot in this game, no main hook, and that leaves it feeling directionless. For anyone disagreeing, let me explain. I'll make a full vid on this soon, but here are the basics. If there's a main plot, you can choose to follow it, which makes the plot people happy. Or you can choose to ignore it and do your own thing. 
which makes the sandbox players happy. If there's no main plot, you can't choose to follow it, which means only the sandbox players will be happy. You've instantly cut out a large percentage of your potential player base. A plot doesn't inherently ruin a game. RuneScape has a plot and most people choose to ignore it and just go and grind skills. By not having a story, you've just made that choice for the player. I'll go into more depth in this in a future video. This game seems to want to be difficult to play, like its complexity is a badge of honour. You know those people that proudly describe themselves as, yeah, I'm an asshole, and act like that's a good, endearing thing, but in reality it just makes them insufferable to be around? This is how that game feels. I talked to the camp guide some more, they just sent me back to the tutors. I've already experienced most of the basic systems, so why would I continue to play? What's my drive? To get better? If that's the case, I'll go and get better at a game that seems happy to have me. Let's go explore the lake, not been that way yet. The gameplay loop in Rhizom is gather items to improve skills, to make equipment, to gather items, to improve skills, to make equipment, to gather items, to you, you get the idea. Oh, and also skills split into sub-skills at higher levels. Let's refer back to that awesome Steam review for a really good explanation. Once you reach level 20 in a profession, the profession then breaks off into two parts. For example, magic will now be split into offensive magic and defensive magic, which both start at level 21, and you will now need to level them both separately. Fast forward to level 50 after many, many hours of grinding away, and offensive magic splits off into offensive affliction magic and elemental magic, and defensive magic splits off into defensive affliction magic and healing magic. So what was once one skill, magic, has now been split into four different things that each need to be leveled up separately. This happens for every profession, so you better be prepared to spend 16 times more time keeping everything up to a reasonable level. So that's going to add even more grind to this already slow, grindy game. And with no plot, it's not like you're grinding to get stronger to stop an event or take part in a crusade. You're doing this for no reason. It's just power for power's sake. I wonder if there are other starting zones. There were four races, so let's see if they begin differently. I log out, and the logout timer is needlessly slow. Here's another minor bug. Pressing backspace deletes a letter in your name, but holding backspace still only deletes one letter. Holding a letter types a string of them, but holding backspace doesn't delete a string of them. Why? No, it turns out it's the same starting zone. This is the new player experience for everyone. If you're a massive Ryzom fan screaming at your screen, but it gets good if you play for hundreds of hours, people said the same thing about Mortal Online, Shroud of the Avatar, and Life is Feudal Online. And the same issues apply. They may be fun for the nostalgic hardcore, but for a new player, they're god-awful. And if you don't believe me, and you're a fan of one of those games, go and play any of the others, and tell me what you think the new player experience is like. Here's something fun. The Steam description of this game proudly shows a review from the website Desora, stating Ryzom is the best MMO I've ever played. Well, that's high praise indeed. I wonder what Desora is. Maybe it's like IGN or massively OP. Maybe it's a respectable website. Not quite. Desora is a content aggregation site that uses clip art graphics to sort games into categories. I don't mean to be crude here, but if you honestly think a recommendation from a site that looks like this is an indication of quality, you're a fucking idiot. By looking at the Metacritic data, it seems people loved this on release. Back in 2004, this game was hyped. Why did it fail? Players like complexity, but they like it when it's explained well. Remember when I said players don't like obscure systems with flaky tutorials and no central plot, and will always gravitate toward games that have easy to understand systems, simply explain mechanics and an actual story? Well, another game released in 2004 that did those things quite well. Another MMO you might have heard of. It's called World of Warcraft. I can hear the Ryzen fans now screaming, but World of Warcraft was aimed at casuals and we were aimed at hardcore players. Yes, exactly, which is why World of Warcraft has the income of a small country and you've got three players on Steam. But everyone seems to like this, from YouTube reviewers to Metacritic to random articles, everyone fondly speaks of Ryzen. 
Maybe they're seeing something I'm not, or maybe they're all wrong. I'm leaning toward the latter, but fine. I will play for a few more hours and see if it gets better. So it turns out speaking to the Kami lets you leave and go to the mainland. Are you telling me this whole area was a tutorial? This whole dull, boring, directionless mess wasn't even the main game. This was a self-contained tutorial and no one mentioned that. Christ, it's like you don't even want new players. But yes, we will go to the mainland. Maybe we'll find the plot. Travelling to the mainland sends you to one of four main cities. I go to the city of Pyre. Also, all my keybinds have now reset themselves. Thanks for that, game. There's a city welcomer right in front of me who sends me to talk to all the important people of the city. The local stable boy asks me to run through the market and finally go to the academy. We go sightseeing, then report back. We're given some teleport scrolls for our troubles, but told some of them won't work until we pray to a certain god and make a pact with them. Why do you feel the need to make teleport scrolls more complex than they need to be? I talk to random NPCs and accept a mission to make some weapons. The weapons I need to make are way above my skill level and I don't know where the materials are. So the game has no problem letting you take on something that is, for the most part, impossible. Sense of freedom, yes. Sense of purpose, yes. Sense of direction, no. I start gathering what raw materials I can find outside the city, I attack something and then these guards rush over to help. It's nice because I feel safe, but it's also annoying because I can only gain experience by killing low level stuff. And if the guards get a single hit in, I get no experience. So I'm waiting for the patrol to move away before I fight stuff. I chat to the city welcomer again, she has some quests for me and sends me to talk to the chief of the guard. He is all the way through the city in the back of the academy. He wants me to go and clear some flying Izams from around a guard tower. While I'm here I chat to the tutors and spend what few skill points I've already earned. This opening quest needs me to kill these flying things, but it's pretty damn difficult when they hit so hard. And if the guards rush over to help, the kill doesn't count. I do run to the guards for cover sometimes, but I'm making very slow progress. I make some boots, which is all I know how to craft. I'd like to buy more recipes, but I need more skill points to do that, so boot making for a while it is. I use up all of the generic crafting stuff I have, and I end up with a lot of boots. I run all the way back to the tutor and spend the skill points. I buy weapon crafting, and I try to do that, but you need a weapon crafting tool, and I only have an armor crafting tool and I'd need to buy tool crafting to make one, and I don't know where to buy one, so I'm kind of stuck. Rhizom seems to pride itself on being difficult to get into, but it's not difficult because the mechanics are understandable and it's challenging a player's skill, like Dark Souls. It's difficult because it doesn't explain the systems and then mocks you for not knowing them. The best way I can make a Rhizom fan understand this is imagine you don't know how to play, say, Warhammer 40k, or Magic the Gathering, or Command and Conquer and you and me sit down for a game and I win because I understand the systems and then I keep boasting about how bad you were and how great I was. Can you imagine how you'd be sat there thinking, it's not that I'm bad at this, it's that I don't have the information required to be good at it and you've not given me any of that. That's how Rhizom feels. It's like if you couldn't play chess but you sat down to play chess against someone and they kept beating you again and again but never explained what the pieces do, they just expected you to slowly learn and get better. That's how Rhizom treats its new players. I cannot get good at something you are not willing to explain to me. The developers are confusing being cryptic with being challenging. Thank you very much to my Discord chat for that awesome line. I sell all my boots and buy a sword. I try and buy some armour from a merchant, but it's all out of my price range. I go back to the city entrance, I grind the smaller enemies for some combat experience, and the sword seems to help. I'm able to take down an Izam, provided my healing spell is ready. And even then, it's down to the wire on health. Oh, also my auto attack has a 75% accuracy rating, but my double damage attack has a 76%, so there's absolutely no reason to ever not use double damage. I find some trainers at the start of town, which is handy, prevents me running all the way back to the academy. Kind of annoying the game didn't show me that. This is so, so grindy, just to level skills, to get more items, to level skills, to get more items. I'm not part of anything. I don't feel like my story matters, because this world is so dead and dull that nothing matters. 
If there's no overarching plot, then my story, no matter how epic I try and make it, will ultimately be irrelevant the moment I decide to stop playing. I then get a PM from another player called Mephisto, asking if I'm new. I explain I am and I've been playing a few hours. He seems shocked I made it to Pyre in only six hours. This implies I was meant to spend even more time in that god-awful tutorial area. I then ask Mephisto what makes this game better than any other MMO. He logs out and doesn't reply. That seems apt. Having the world tree above us is cool and the enemies have some nice art direction but honestly Rhizom feels so self-absorbed and so proud of being hardcore and not holding your hand that it's dug its own grave. It's made no effort to innovate. Old players are crying out for both new content and no new changes and new players are punished for, in essence, not already being old players. Walking into a martial arts dojo for your first lesson and being mocked for not being a black belt. That's Rhizom. Going to learn a new language and being laughed out the class because you're not already fluent. That's Rhizom. Showing an interest in any hobby, then being sent to the world championships of that hobby and being expected to figure it out as you go. That's Rhizom. It's not that any individual system within the game is bad or that the gameplay isn't salvageable, its problems come from its own attitude. Rhizom is so focused on being hardcore that it's removed any and all systems that might even be considered casual, including an understandable tutorial and a definitive narrative structure to the gameplay. It's so focused on being complex that it's willing to do anything to appear complex including not explaining things and counting your confusion as a positive. Ultimately, Rhizom doesn't give a crap if you play it or not. It's the game equivalent of someone who sits in the corner of a party trying to look mysterious, not talking to anyone, and then wondering why no one wants to talk to them. It does actually have a lot to offer, but it makes no effort to help you experience it. Rhizom was designed in such a way that it doesn't care if you play it and it doesn't make any effort to be playable. And because of this, it succeeded. No one has played it. You've only got yourself to blame, Rhizom. You wanted to be the hardcore realistic game that was hard to get into, hard to understand and hard to play. And you succeeded. So I normally end these videos with a score out of 10. Normally it's something humorous, but let's be honest. Let's do this Rhizom style, because that's far too simple. The score bracket is D, but within that bracket it plays 37th. Now you have to actually gather five reviews and watch them all count down, but you can only equip one review at a time and then you must switch reviews for different areas. Graphics, audio, UI. Then at 10 reviews, the reviews split into generally positive and generally negative. Then they split down further into graphical overhaul, graphical interface, AI, user interface, sound design, and then you can trade in review points to unlock more reviews. But none of this will ever be explained to you, and you'll be treated like an idiot for not knowing it from the very start. Cheers for watching. If you want more gaming videos, then drop a like or sub to the channel. A massive thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make all my videos possible. You can support the Patreon from only £1 a month. Let me know what you think in the comments below, then check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and Discord. And as always, have a great day.